First and foremost, again, my name is Dean Butson. I'm the geography professor at Lincoln Land uh, Community College. Um, I've been there for, this is my 19th year at Lincoln Land. Um, I'm the only geography professor at Lincoln Land as well. I teach four different geography courses. I teach world regional geography, human geography, physical geography, and weather and climate. As we'll see, kind of the base geography courses, especially for those that might be going into a major. But first and foremost, this is Geography Awareness Week. So I wanted to say a big happy Geography Awareness Week. <laughs> <laughs> we just can't have too many globes. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is, and, and GIS Day is actually on Wednesday. So this is our day to take a step back and celebrate geography. But even before I get into geography itself, I want to talk a little bit about myself in terms of how I ended up getting into the field because I never knew there really was a field of geography. I actually started my freshman year as a chemistry major, and I was thinking I'd be going into the medical field, was kind of my plan at the time. I got to my sophomore year, first week of class, I was in organic chemistry, I was in the lab, and I was like, ugh, I don't really like this. <laughs> what am I gonna do? So I went back, I looked at the catalog, I'm like, well, there's a class on maps, and there's a class on weather, I've always loved these things. I just never knew I could do something with them. And so from there, I'm like, okay, I dropped my, I dropped my chemistry courses, and then I took geography. And then it's just kind of my path just went from there. I ended up actually starting out and going into broadcast meteorology. It was kind of my focus. Um, but then I went uh, to grad, and I never thought I'd ever end up teaching ever. That was something I never was in, the, in my wheelhouse at all. So. Yeah, so that's kind of where, where I'm at, and of course I, I love it, I love sharing everything I can about geography. So, when we think about geography, what is geography? I think we tend to think about location, which of course is a significant part of geography. But even when I ask my students, many of them have never taken a geography course when they get to, to college. And I'll say, you know, how many of you are taking this course, do you know what it's about? And most of them think it's going to be memorizing locations. You know, the you know, state capitals, countries, and so on. Yes, that's an important part of it, but it's so much more. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So when we're talking about geography itself, and I kind of hit some key words here when we're thinking about geography. The study of places. Okay, so that makes sense. That's kind of like, okay, location, places. But, how do we look at the big picture? This is important, relationships. We're looking at relationships between people, what I like to say, the human world, the cultural world, and their environments, and how they interact. And I'm gonna give you examples of this as we, as we move along here. So, really what's kind of fun about geography too is it's never boring. I always tell my students, you're always I have two students here, actually. What do I always say? You live in what you're learning. <laughs> you live in what you're learning. Always look at what you're learning because it's happening all around us all the time. But what's really neat about geography is it almost has two separate parts. We have the physical geography portion of it, and then we have the human cultural end of it as well. And as we'll see, we can bring these two together and look at the relationships. So when I'm talking about physical geography, so much there. We're looking at climates. You know, one of the things that we hear a lot about in the news today is climate change, right? That's a big part of geography. We know the science behind it, but how does that affect people and places? Landforms, vegetation, soils, that's important for this part of the country, isn't it? Especially when we're talking about agriculture. Water as well is important too. So some questions that we pose when we're talking about physical geography, what happens when a volcano erupts? Why does it erupt? Why are volcanoes in the northwest part of the United States in terms of being dominant there in the Cascades? Why is there volcanoes in Hawaii? Why do hurricanes and tornadoes form where they do? Why is hurricane season from June 1st to November 30th? Why is tornado season tends to be the heart of it being the spring of the year? Why 
is that the case? And what does that mean? What does that mean for the people living in those areas that are most likely to be affected by hurricanes and tornadoes? As I mentioned, what does climate change mean? Real quick, we're not going to talk a lot about climate change itself, it's an entity there, but when we're talking about global warming, that's a warming, consistent warming on average of our globe's temperatures. Climate change is taking into effect the causes of that warming. So we can have cold spells, you know, and of course we can have warm spells, we can have droughts, we can have flooding, we can have extremes happening with climate change. Climate is an average. Weather is now. It's always changing. People say, don't like the weather, wait a minute. Especially in central Illinois. It will change for you. But again, climate is a 30-year period. So when you're looking and you're like, hey, we had a we had a wind chill temperature of minus 30 degrees, the temperature was minus 10, you're like, whoa, how come it's so cold? But if you look at the globe's average temperature, you'll see that it's going up. So that's what we're looking at for a climate change. So they forecast the weather, they use land and water resources, uh, plans for forests, rangelands, wetlands, there's so much there. Now human geography, we're looking more at the cultural end of geography, so the lives and activities of people. So when I teach world geography, I teach human geography, we talk about migration, we talk about immigration, we talk about uh, migration, especially in developing parts of the world, from rural to urban areas. Why do we see people doing this? Why do we see our urban areas growing so much, those populations? Why do we see, for example, we hear about population and we think about overpopulation being an issue? But what also is an issue is populations that are growing, an aging population, especially in developed countries such as our own. But why do they move? Why do they move from country to country? Why do they move from rural areas to urban areas? There's three main reasons. Economics, that being a big one, uh, political issues, as well as environmental issues. What happens when we exploit our Earth's resources? You know, if we're looking at fossil fuels, for example, or we're looking at our technology that we use, where do the components that go into our technology come from? Many of that, many of those minerals and such will come from developing parts of the world, such as Africa. So, how, what does that mean for the people there? Human geographers work in so many different fields as well. Urban and regional planning, transportation, real estate, tourism, um, international business, and just really, again, the cultural end as well. So, we have physical geography, we have human geography, geographers examine then how culture interacts with the natural environment and how those locations and places can have an impact on people. That's what it comes down to. So we study the link between human activity and natural systems. This is a big thing too. And how they are distributed across space. The distribution of cro across space. How things interact across space by linking the human world and the physical world. So when I'm breaking this down, I always like this diagram because it's showing, I always like to tell my students these are even different areas where you could kind of subsets of what geography that you can focus on when you're majoring. So as I mentioned, the physical geography world here. Water, too, is a big issue. You know, we hear about water in terms of thinking about the droughts out west, water for, agri for agriculture, irrigation, very, being very important. We also concern about water in terms of polluting water in other parts of the world as well. And then we get into, again, the cultural, studying population, economics, languages, religions, there's so many just really fascinating things to study about the world and how it interacts. So, we're always asking questions. Okay. Where things are found, why they are there, how they develop, and how they change over time. These are always things, we're always thinking about the big, big picture. So when we look at geography, I always also say geography is like a web. And we have one thing happening, but how does that web grow and affect so many other different things? That's what's important. So, the 
the questions of geography are. What is where? Why is it there? Why do I care? <laughs> <laughs> what does this all mean? And it, uh, it's important because we, we really do, in the end, we really do care about what's going on in our world. So, I want to give you some examples here when you're thinking about geography. First question I'm going to pose to you is, how did you get here? Okay, so when, when you got here, did you drive? Did you take public transportation? Did you take the bus? Did you walk? Were you close enough where you could walk? Did you ride your bike? Did you ride your bike? So how did you get here? If you didn't know where the library was, what did you use to get you to this point? How many of you use a paper? How many of you use paper maps? Still. No. Good. I was like one of the last pulls out. I, this is a little funny story. Um, my, my family and I we took a trip, I think it was like 2014, out east to Washington, D.C. And I refused to use <laughs> GPS. And I had the map on the dashboard. Of course, that's a pretty congested part of the country in terms of driving. <laughs> and I think my kids were yelling at me. But then I'm like, all right, so now I don't. But, you know, we do use maps. One of the things I think that um, when we're talking about our relationship with space, so, of course, many of us use this, don't we? Google, how do we get here? Ask for directions. Takes you from point A to point B. But one of the things that when we're looking at a paper map that we start to miss is our spatial awareness. That's so important. Instead, someone's just telling us where to go, that you're not really thinking about your surroundings, are you? You're just kind of following along and trying to get there. Sometimes it's not always right. <laughs> and then you're like, well, what do I do now? But it's important still to be able to look at the big picture map so you can you know, know your surroundings and have that spatial awareness, which again is really important. So if I were to ask someone that was here and someone you said, hey, I need, I need directions to get to the library. How do I get here? Depends where you're coming from, doesn't it? We have landmarks, don't we? A lot of times we'll have landmarks and we'll say, you know, if you're downtown, there's the old state capitol, you're getting into the right area, maybe the Hilton, for example. <laughs> um, but it depends. If you're coming in on 6th Street, you might say, hey, go by the Cozy Drive. You'll go by Cozy, the Cozy Dragon there. If you're coming in from the east, going down Grand, you'll say, hey, you'll see me and J.C. Penney's. So you're giving people visual recognition of their place in space. So it's taking them outside of just something, telling them where to go. Because it's not going to say, you're going past the J.C. Penney's, for example. Or MacArthur, you might be going by hy V. You know, what are those main landmarks that you're going to be telling people? So probably most of us knew how to get here, right? To the, to the library, I think most of us have been here. And so we didn't really have to think a lot about it. But I'll ask my students, because a lot of them are first-time students to Lincoln Land, and I'll ask them, you know, how did you get here? And, you know, a lot of them will be like, well, I don't, let me think about that. And then I'll say, help someone how to get here so they can use those landmarks. And I'll make it kind of straightforward by going off 55, taking Toronto Road, and what are some of the main landmarks that you'll see, like looking easy, going over the railroad tracks, the fire station, those types of things. All right, so things that we take for granted. A pencil. We don't really think a lot about a pencil, except that we need to write with, right? But when we talk about geography, we're talking about globalization. And that's a big thing, of course, nowadays, isn't it? Globalization, how we all interact globally. So much of the things that we do take for granted or depend on come from other parts of the world. And it's not necessarily just the pencil itself as one entity. It's the pieces and parts of the pencil, right? So I just have some examples here. You know, if you're looking at the graphite, of course, that uses uh, to leave the mark to write with. Um, but when we're looking at just the graphite itself, 
where are some sources of where that's that's from? Mexico, Brazil. About the wood, the soft wood. Soft wood is conifer trees, uh, coniferous trees, excuse me, pines, spruces, cedar woods commonly used in pencil production. It encases the graphite, making it easier for the writer to hold. So some just examples. South Africa, Northern Europe, Sweden. How about the paint? The paint is the yellow casing. These are protective and also decorative too. It's not toxic it's usually used in nowadays, of course, in pencil production, especially for, for school-age children. But Kazakhstan, which used to be part of the former Soviet Union, now it's a new type of country. Estonia as well, so some of your uh, former uh, Eastern Bloc countries. The rubber used to make the eraser. So tropical plants. So rubber coming from Southeast Asia, places like Thailand and Malaysia, too. Now, when we think about where this is coming from, we think, okay, cool, this stuff's coming from these different places. But then we also want to think about how is it getting here in terms of what's being done to those resources and to the physical geography world. Are we seeing more deforestation happening? And those types of things. So we can our demands for these things will continue. The metal, the aluminum. To make metal uh, that's attached to the end of the pencil holds the eraser in place. Um, compounds are pretty abundant. China being a big source of where that's coming from. Mozambique in Sub Saharan Africa, too. So that's globalization. Just by looking at pencil, one pencil. Think about it, and well, we often do this in class. If you have a coat um, or something that you can look at, maybe we can go around the room if you have a piece of clothing to see where did it come from? Where was it made? Anyone around volunteer? <laughs> Just to see. Because again, so many things that we use today come from other parts of the world. Manufactured in other parts of the world. It's cheaper labor, right? So that allows us to have those items of cheaper as well. Did you guys? Vietnam. Vietnam. China. China. We are seeing, which is interesting, we've seen a, a, a kind of a migration in terms of industrialization, going to Mexico cheaper, going overseas to China cheaper. Now we, we're seeing um, rising, um, rising uh, cost, cost of living is getting better, more middle class in China. So now we're seeing Vietnam, for example. So, and we're seeing that globalization. So that's the connection. Globalization is connected to parts of the world, the expansion of culture. So this is really interesting. We're talking about globalization. We're expanding cultures, right? We're getting to know other parts of the world and other cultures of the world, which is so important because we can appreciate all of our different cultures too. So what we sometimes will refer or what we will refer to as assimilation. But it's also important for those cultures to hold on to what defines them. And I'll often use this too. We each are unique, we're each special, we each have our own suitcase, don't we? And in our suitcase is what defines us. It could be our language, it could be our religion, it could be our material items, our ethnicity. All those things are unique to us and what defines us. So it's important for us to appreciate that and understand that. And of course globalization does help with that, but we also see some of the, the negatives of globalization as well. This I always use, this still, this always, I have to say, this is the one thing that I still just blows my mind. I think about this all the time for some reason because I always tell this too to my students. Think about this, walk into a grocery store, say Myers or High Bean, you usually go right to the produce, that's usually right at the front of the store, isn't it? it grabs you right there. But think about this. You're like, okay, I'm filling up my cart with this produce. Yes, our prices have been higher lately. But think about that's Myers. Think about all the grocery stores just in in, in Springfield. Schnucks, Target, Walmart. Think about all the grocery stores in Illinois. Think about all the grocery stores in the United States and the world. I mean, it really, when you think about that, 
And think about all that's offered to us. It's really the whole globalization part of it is amazing, really, when you think about it. I remember the time when I was younger walking into a grocery store in the produce section in January, and you would not have blueberries, raspberries, strawberries. You have only what was in season. But we've really expanded, haven't we, and that's globalization. So some of these the parts of the world where things are being grown now didn't at one time. So this I just have a I just created this kind of snapshot map here. And it is, if you are in the grocery store, just take a take a minute when you're picking out, especially your produce, look at where it comes from. Especially this time of year. As then having to produce more of those items to feed our demand. Especially some of the things that we're looking at in terms of pretty significant rise there would be, um, and this is just really within the past 10 years, look at how much of an increase we've seen. But berries, avocados as well uh, has gone up. This is also an interesting graph. This is just showing um, some of our locations where we do see a lot of our um, produce coming from, fruits and vegetables. And I want you to look here, the blue is 2009, 2014, so every five years. Look at that jump there from 2009 to 2019. Mexico accounts for over half of the $14 billion of U.S. fresh food imports. That's in 2019. But also, I'm like, look at this. Look at, like, Peru. Almost nothing. <laughs> it's not nothing, but look at how small that is. Peru has seen the fastest growth in fresh food exports to the U.S. over the past decade. Again, to fuel our demand. So we look at that and we're, we say, yes, we're fortunate to have those offerings. But where that's coming from, what is the process of getting that to us? How is that being done as well? You know, if we're using the cheaper labor, how is it taxing the land, how is it taxing the environment, how is it taxing water resources? We talk about, in my classes too, what we call virtual water. It's the amount of water that you use from point A to point B. We tend to think of using water, you know, drinking water, washing an apple. But what is how much water is being used to grow that apple, get that apple to us, and then that end product too. So we see very high virtual water contents with the whole transportation process as well. So why? Why do we see this? And I just have this table here. I, I'm, I'm going to pick out a couple things here. And I think it's kind of interesting because it does sum up for us globalization and geography itself. I'll get rid of the why there. <laughs> but so one of the things that we're looking at, off-season supplies. Most U.S. fruits and vegetables are produced um, between May and October, and some cannot be stored for long periods of time, like especially your berries. That's why you see those berries go up as well. Berries and grapes. Um, limited production. It depends on the climate, too. There are concerns out west because, again, we're seeing continuing drought, lack of water, availability. What does that mean? Or what we rely on and take for granted out west. It's kind of interesting, competitive production of broad foreign producers have low labor and cost and other costs. So again, where you have that lower labor cost, you're going to track that coming from those areas too. Transportation costs too, you have to think about that as well. And we hear so much, I mean I could go on and on about what's going in the, on in the world today. We talk about the cargo ship issue and the, the production chain. Um, kind of shut down, that kind of thing, um, especially with the pandemic. But if costs go up, where are those, how is that passed on? How are those rising costs passed on? They're passed down to the consumers, right? And that's one reason why we've seen that increase in our uh, grocery bills as well. And that's, this is just a snapshot of it. So we'll turn it, turn it a little bit. Another question that we pose is, I pointed this out when we were looking at the physical geography. Why do most tornadoes occur in this part of the world, which is Tornado Alley in the United States? 
States, so from Texas up to South Dakota. So again, this is important because many of us don't really think, we think, oh, tornadoes happen in a certain part of the United States. Why did it happen there? What does that mean for the people living there? You'll talk to people that were born and raised in California. They think we have tornadoes all the time here. <laughs> They're just like we might think they have earthquakes all the time. So, but why do we, and I just wanted to kind of segue a little bit just to explain that because, it, because we do have the spring of the year being the most active time for tornadoes. But we do see a surge happening in the fall of the year. Why is that the case? Well, you guys know that we've been dealing, especially up and down with temperatures, where it was really warm last week and it got cold. If you remember about three weeks ago, we had a pretty active severe weather on Sunday as we transitioned from one air mass to another. Basically, it comes down to conflict here. We have cold, dry air coming from Canada, warm, humid air coming from the Gulf of Mexico. The jet stream is our upper level winds. They're found about 18,000 feet above the surface, above what we call the friction layer. So those winds are moving pretty quick there. And when that jet stream does a dip like this, I like this, that's a big old trough that they call it. It looks like a big U. That's where activity can happen. And especially in the spring of the year, it's still cold, right? We're still holding on to those winter characteristics in Canada, but things are starting to really warm up in the south. So that's where that clash happens. So what does that mean, though? I mean, we might say, yeah, okay, that's, that's cool, but what does that mean for the people living there? Well, for one, we have to be prepared, right? If you remember 2011, 2013, we had some very significant devastating tornadoes in Oklahoma, in Joplin, in Alabama. In Oklahoma, for example, you may remember it was captured live. It was happening in the afternoon, and we have five tornado. The wind speeds over 200 miles per hour. It hit a couple schools, unfortunately. So how do we prepare in terms of tornado safety in our schools? It's costly to do that. We also want to look at this. Where is Tornado Alley? This is our old Tornado Alley. But we've seen an eastward migration in terms of more tornadoes spreading east. Does anyone know? Um, except Blake, you can't answer this one. Does anyone know about how many tornadoes we average in the United States in a year? You can throw out that. Three hundred. It's like about fifteen hundred. Yeah, it's closer to fifteen hundred. Yeah, so we see about fifteen hundred tornadoes in the in the United States every year. Now again, a lot of those tornadoes are weak. Um, they'll be down and they'll be up. They still come as a tornado. Do you know one reason why we see one of the tornadoes? Because we all have homes that have cameras, and so we see so many more people capturing tornadoes and getting that footage of them. So, you know, but, but it does help scientists understand tornadoes a little bit better because we still need to be able to better predict tornadoes because that science is still blooming and still growing there. But when we look at that new tornado alley, we actually have what we call Dixie Alley tornadoes. In the southern states, that tends to be February, March when it's most active, and then it progresses northward. But again, we kind of fall in the heart of that area. So this is a, a thunderstorm day map. And a, a thunderstorm day is defined as a day when you hear thunder. So it may not produce precipitation. And we see here in central Illinois between 40 and 50 thunderstorm days a year. But look at here, Florida. We tend to think about thunderstorms occurring quite often in Florida, right? Almost daily if you've ever been there. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the heating, what we call conductive heating. And sea breezes coming in and converging and lifting that air up. But these are the top five states for tornadoes. Uh, the number of tornadoes per 10,000 square miles. We are number five, Illinois is. Number one is Florida. So notice Florida doesn't fall in the typical um, 
Tornado Alley area. And the reason why is because when hurricanes make landfall, they'll produce tornadoes. So that's why we see those numbers go up. Because not only are, torn are hurricanes devastating for what they are with the storm surge and everything, but also they can produce those tornadoes too. So this is just showing the averages tornadoes by month. And as I mentioned, April, May, June tend to be our dominant months of, of tornadoes. But as I said, think about central Illinois. Think about when we've had some of our devastating tornadoes. Think about um, 20, 2013, 2013, the Washington tornado that hit there. That was an EF4. Think about the Taylorville tornado that hit December 1st, 2018. So they typically occur during the day, the heating of the day, but they can form whenever they want. They have minds of their own. <laughs> so any time of day, any time of year, any place they want to develop, it can be over an urban area, it can be, of course, rural areas as well. So that at least, that gives us some idea in terms of what geography is. And I think, you know, leaving us with questions always questioning why things are happening the way they are. But also, what does that mean for all of us? In the I think that's what's important in terms of the table and what geography is. So it's not just location, it's not just place names, it's the big picture, it's the web. I want to turn now to kind of an, also an offset of geography, which is geographic information systems. Now, some of us may, may hear that term geospatial technologies, it incorporates, for example, GPS. And I showed you the, you know, we have GPS units in our phone for location, looking at our latitude and longitude. But how do then do we migrate to what we call GIS, or geographic information systems? So it's, again, kind of looking at the big picture is what it's doing. It creates, it's a system that creates, manages, analyzes, and maps all types of data. So basically, I like to call what I when I think about GIS, I like to say we're marrying data to a map. We're making a map intelligent. You use it again. You use it on your phones, and a lot of times now, you know, you may look at your phone. You may know where to go, but you may put in how do I get from point A to B in case there's construction or accidents. That's a piece of data that's on that map. There. So where things are, and then what things are like there. So we're looking again at that big picture. So GIS integrates so much. Of course, you have your hardware. You know, you have your base in terms of you know your computer in terms of storing that data. Software, how do you analyze that data and data the data itself? You need that data to build that system. So we capture, we manage, we analyze, and display that data in a map format. I'm going to give you some examples here in just a minute. All that geographic information. GIS allows us to view, visualize, question, that's important, understand, interpret spatial data. So how things are placed in space. What have we been dealing with for the past year and a half, over a year and a half? COVID, right? And it's really been fascinating to watch in terms of the GIS world and geospatial technologies roll with this because they said, hey, we have to do something when the pandemic started. So John Hopkins, for example, Western Illinois, they created the GIS dashboards showing where those cases were rising, showing, you know, the number of um, people that that had it or the number of deaths, then the number of people recovered. All of that was happening and giving us a visual. So GIS reveals patterns, relationships, trends. So if we go back to the COVID situation, what are the trends? Where's, how's it spreading from point A to B? Where's it spreading the most from point A to B? Um, so we're looking at maps, we're looking at reports, we're looking at charts to come up with conclusions. So with GIS, what is happening? What has happened? 
and we'll, what will happen from that. So again, using COVID as a per current example, what is happening? We know we have cases of COVID going up in certain areas. Okay, that's happening. What is happening? Why is it happening the way it is? What's it going to do in the future? Where is it going to go in the future? So how can we better prepare for, for that? So that's our geographic space. We're looking at the big picture there. So when we're looking at GIS, we're looking at different layers of data. And you can turn these layers on and off. We have street data, building data, vegetation, integrated data. So say, for example, we have a large retail store that wants to come into Springfield. They just don't say, hey, we're going to plop down right here and put in a retail store. They use this information to say, hey, this is a good place to to build. We have good transportation routes. Um, we don't have to worry as much about, you know, in terms of what is the geology like. You know, this is a good place for that. Water resources and so on. You know, populations around us. All those types of things. So, I like this. And then we always try to use this too. You know, we can read all this data, right? All these data, a lot of that's numbers and da 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 doesn't really mean much to us, does it? But when it's in a visual format, visualization is worth a thousand words. It makes it so much easier, doesn't it, for us to understand what's going on. Who uses GIS? So many of us use GIS. Professionally, public safety, 911. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples here. Of course, education, as mentioned, emergency services, environmental, business, different, Many different groups use GIS. Industry as well. So we didn't have a very good um, <laughs> internet connection. So I did, I did at the time because we weren't sure if we would. So I made a capture, a screen, a screen capture of the site. And this was a, this was a fun one. This is showing. It's called the Food Atlas, and you can, if you want, um, you can actually just type in just Google Food Atlas. It's really cool though because it, you can zoom into different parts of the world and if you zoom in closer, like say in, into Africa, you'll have more options available to you. And you can click on the, the food item there and it will tell you the food, about that food item, why it's important and significant to the culture. It's just a really fun tool. You know, you get that nice visual and say you're traveling, hopefully someday we'll be able to travel again. You know, this is something you can use in terms of, hey, you know, what's, what types of food do these different places offer? This is, again, this is a tornado tracker. So it kind of goes from what we were talking about with, with tornadoes. Uh, you can just type in a tornado tracker as well, Google that. It's Purdue University who hosts the, the GIS site there. But this is showing, and I just have turned on, uh, tornadoes are ranked in magnitude from EF0 to EF5 even worse. So I have the more destructive tornadoes turned on right there. But if you click on the tornado path, it's going to tell you about that tornado. Were there injuries? What were the costs for that tornado um, in terms of damages? Were there deaths and those types of things? What size it was? So it's a really valuable tool um, to use. So they have a nice GIS dashboard for COVID. You can put that in too. But this is looking by county, and again, this, there's quite a bit of data here, but you can click right on the county and it'll tell you, you know, information in terms of, because now we have so much data that we've built up over the last year and a half, so you can nail that down to the more recent um, time frame, time period. But again, it's really, a, it's really a cool tool. And it's interesting, you're talking to the people that especially at Western that, that created this dashboard, how they just kind of like, hey, we, there's a need here. And they just jumped right on it. And getting students and graduate students and stuff together to create and then maintain this as well through, through the pandemic. So this also brings us then to our map, a, a map that, um, we created with Urban Action Network. And Urban Action Network, you can again go to their website and they we created, um, it's been three years, Sustained Springfield, 
This is a, a what we call the sustained, sustained Springfield Green Map. And um, in conjunction with Urban Action Network, Lincoln Land, our geography program, uh, GIS students, and um, I think Geospatial and Jenny Dahl's here too, so she was a big part of this in terms of the maintaining of this map. But basically, you can go to this map right now and say you want to know, hey, where can I recycle eyeglasses? <laughs> and you can, you know, you can find that information and it will tell you where to, to do that. So um, it, it was a, a kind of an undertaking to get this all together when you collect the data, but it's also an undertaking. One thing about the data, your maps are only, only as good as the data, right? So the data has to be maintained and updated all the time, whether an address changes or a phone number changes, that type of thing. So with our dashboard, again, you can get to it. If we click Project Gallery, we can also get um, to, we have students have created a map of tiny, tiny libraries around the Springfield area, and also um, the, uh, food, the food pantries, too. So we have some cool stuff out there. So I do have, this is the site of where the Sustained Springfield Green Map is, but if you just type in Urban Action Network Sustained Springfield Green Map, it will come right up. I also want to mention, we, are, we do offer an introduction to GIS course at Lincoln Land. Um, we offer a GIS certificate program, which is new, where we offer an intro and advanced class, a couple computer science courses as well. Um, they go with that, so you get that database knowledge too. So I just have the intro uh, up there. It's in the evenings, um, so if anyone's interested. And I also wanted to now kind of, just because we're talking about geography, and this is Geography Awareness Week, and some of us have geography um, experience here, and some of them I wanted to, I told them I couldn't, I was going to pick on the guy. And what you're doing. So uh, Zane, right now, he's, you can, you can go ahead and talk, but Zane has taken both the intro GIS course and the advanced GIS course right now. And he, you can, I'll, I'll let you speak for yourself, but I'm trying to get him to be geography major. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's figuring that out right now. So do you want to talk anything about your GIS experience? Or? Well, um, from my experience, it has been an interesting outlook on how uh, data can be expressed via your, like, how you can express your resources, mainly. My first project for the, introdu inter uh, the introduction to the GIS, I created a school map, putting down all of the different uh, uh, classrooms and faculty put in uh, areas within the school. and basically making an interactive app for which you could actually go in for this for only a but I didn't do a the whole campus for being still campus but I did the Menard and the Sangamon Hall. So I had all the different departments outlined and all the different things. And the mentality behind this was that so that way whenever a new student comes into the school or inside or wants to know where they need to go in that certain area of the building Instead of having to go and get a paper map where you can like, you might lose it, you might forget where it's at, 